Right. I think some folks are still trickling in, but I want to go ahead and get started and be respectful of everyone's time. So I wanted to thank everyone for joining us here today. First, I just want to start off with a few lo logistical notes. Um, the chat is not on, but we do have the live Q&A function that will be available throughout the presentation. We are going to hold off on probably answering the questions live until the session at the very end. But if the questions come up throughout the presentation, you can go ahead and ask questions through that Q&A function. Uh, we'll be monitoring it, just probably holding off and answering it until the very end in case some of the questions get answered as they come up. Um, but feel free to ask that. And then if you have a logistical issue that comes up or a technical issue you're dealing with, you can ask it in that Q&A function as well. Um, we're also, if some of your questions are not answered at the very, by the end of the, um, of the webinar, I'll be sending a follow-up email with my contact information and any questions that are not answered, then you can reach out to me directly and we'll make sure that everything, um, there's a follow-up, um, in the coming weeks. And then with that, we'll go ahead and get started. My name's Josh Dubensky, he, him pronouns. I work for on housing policy for SAGE. Uh, SAGE is one of the country's oldest and largest organizations dedicated to improving the lives of LGBTQ plus older adults. Our goal is to ensure that all aging services, regardless of where an individual chooses to live, are safe and affirming for LGBTQ plus older adults. For too long, the public and policymakers have failed to incorporate the needs of the LGBTQ plus community when discussing aging policy. And this includes access to safe and affordable housing. We know that LGBTQ plus older adults experience disproportionate rates of financial insecurity when compared to their non-LGBTQ plus counterparts. With widespread financial insecurity in the LGBTQ plus older adult community, the rising cost of housing across the country presents a significant barrier to accessing housing. And LGBTQ plus older adults experience housing discrimination that keeps them from accessing and seeking out available housing services with many feeling it is safer to hide who they are when seeking somewhere to live. Almost 50% of same-sex presenting couples have been discriminated against when seeking out housing with landlords or homeowners. Long-term data is difficult to find, but this problem persists even with the historic decision to expand the protections of the Fair Housing Act to protect against discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Members of the community still face housing discrimination at an alarming rate but many will also choose not to report discrimination for fear of retaliation or a belief that government will not support them. That is why strengthening relationships and building trust between the community and allies in government is so important. There may be historic gridlock on Capitol Hill. However, there are many programs that already exist that while they may not have been created specifically for the LGBTQ plus community could still have a tremendous impact. But understanding the many different grants, how they can be used, who is eligible to receive them, and how a local community organization could become involved can be overwhelming. We don't have time today to go through every federal agency and potential grant or program that is underutilized by the LGBTQ plus community, but we are lucky to be joined today by staff from the Department of Housing and Urban Development's Office of Community Planning and Development. Under the Biden administration, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, also known as HUD, has been taking steps to improve housing policy for the LGBTQ plus community. We thank the Office of Community Planning and Development's willingness to be here today in order to talk about the important work they do, walk through how the various programs they oversee impact communities, and discuss opportunities for organizations and advocates to take in order to become involved and have a hand in the process. So again, thank you all for being here today. And with that, I will turn it over to Beth. Hi hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited to talk to you about the Office of Black Grant Programs as well as our other programs known as CWG Home, CWG CV and others. We have a variety of activities that can be used to help the folks that you serve. More importantly, we also wanna be able to talk to you about while we're in DC, we wanna to say to you, how can you access that funding at the local level and also learn how decisions are made at the local level about how that funding is made available as well. I'm gonna stop talking now about the why we're gonna do this and turn it over and get into the actual details. I'd like to turn the presentation over to our two presenters today, Naya Ford and also Rachel Kais. Awesome, thanks Beth. Um, Nadia, I will let you share your screen as you're working on getting that pulled up. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so pleased to that we could join you today. My name is Rachel Kais, and as Beth said, I work um, in the Office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Grant Programs um, in the Office of Community Planning and Development at HUD. Um, and, uh, well, Nadia, when you've 
solved the various technical issues that are sure to arise, um, I'll let you say hello. Um, and I use she, her pronouns. Hi everyone, my name is Nadia Ford and I work alongside Beth and Rachel. I'm really excited to be here uh, speaking with all of you today and I can't wait to dive into all of these details. Awesome. So I'm gonna kick us off and then I'll turn it over to Nadia um, for the second half of the presentation. Um, so as a, to lay the foundations, um, in the Office of Community Planning and Development here at HUD, we are dedicated to community-centered development, empowering local communities to invest in more affordable, equitable, and sustainable futures for their neighborhoods with a focus on the most underserved. In practice, this looks like ensuring access to decent, affordable housing, a safe and sustainable living environment, strong economic opportunities, and community-centered development, all with a renewed focus on equity and inclusion. We achieve these goals through partnerships with all levels of government, with nonprofits, with local community members themselves, and with the private sector. Um, CPD funding can be used for the many critical priorities on the screen right now. Um, and our office, the Office for Grant Programs, oversees several of the funding streams that can support the population you work closely with um, as part of community, community development priorities on a large scale. Yeah. So you'll go to the next screen, Nadia. Next slide, thank you. So before we dive into the funding streams themselves, here we have an overview of how the funding in our office moves from HUD to your local community. So each year, uh, Congress appropriates funding for our annual grant programs. And in certain instances, like some of the grants that we'll talk about today, special funding that comes um, for example, we saw a lot of new one-time funding during the pandemic, obviously, um, to aid with uh, response and recovery. So within CPD, most of our funding streams and all that we're touching on today are allocated or distributed by a formula to states, to urban counties, and to metropolitan cities. Um, then states pass through funds to smaller counties and cities that don't qualify for direct allocations because of their size. Um, from there, the grant recipients, again, those cities and counties, um, can either directly carry out programs themselves, or they can partner with sub-recipients to help administer programs. So sub-recipients can be other public agencies that um, didn't receive the grant directly from HUD, um, a public, public or private nonprofit organization, a community-based development organization, or in some cases, a for-profit entity as well. Um, and we know that local organizations play a really important role in helping CPD funds benefit communities. You not only have the specialized expertise and capacity to carry out programs that have that can have the greatest impact on the target population, but you have a deep knowledge of and already strong relationships with the people you serve, which is really critical, um, especially when serving populations that haven't always been part of um, and welcomed into these processes. So the first of these funding streams we're talking about today is the Community Development Block Grant or CDBG program. CDBG provides flexible formula grant funding to states, urban counties, cities, and insular areas, which you like think of the territories, um, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands. Um, this is for a wide variety of community, community development priorities. When I say wide variety, I mean it. Grantees can determine which of the 26 different eligible activities they'll fund to meet local needs. We'll get into that in a minute, but it's quite a wide range of, of um, activities that folks can carry out under CDBG to help meet local need. Um, the activities must meet, however, one of the three national objectives of the program. The one that's most commonly used and most pertinent to our conversation here today is the is benefit to low and moderate income persons, which is um, yeah most often used across CDBG. Um, you can see the other two um, national objectives on the screen, but again, those are a little bit less common, and I think a little bit less relevant here. So next slide, Nadia, thank you. So let's take a bit to dig into those 26 different eligible activities, right? We sometimes, and well, for the purpose of today, gonna group CDBG into three sort of big categories. 
housing and real property activities, economic and public infrastructure activities, um, and public service activities. So although new construction of housing is generally not an eligible activity under the CDBG program, there are a number of ways that CDBG can support safe, secure housing and continued, continued home ownership, um, including for older adults who are hoping to age in place or looking for uh, an affordable home. So CDBG can be used for home ownership activities like down payment assistance or closing costs. Another really big activity here under this bucket is housing rehab. Um, this can be full house rehab, spot house, spot rehab, or emergency repair services. So this could be programs for accessibility, like installing ramps or grab bars, grab bars for mobility, or emergency repairs, again, for situations like a leaking roof, a leaking roof. Um, weatherization and energy efficiency are also eligible types of programs. Um, so for example, Commerce City Colorado runs a program carrying out exterior painting services for seniors and disabled homeowners with CDBG dollars. Charleston, South Carolina on the screen has used CDBG funds for 40 years, partnering with nonprofits to carry out housing rehab activities. Um, and some places may give priority when they run their um, housing rehab programs to specific populations like seniors or, or other target populations that they see a really um, high unmet need for. On the economic development front, these are things like job training and employment services, small business and micro enterprise support, or commercial rehab and development. The example photo on the screen is of a project in Buffalo, New York, using CDBG to convert a vacant library into a space, a workspace for small neighborhood businesses, particularly for minority and women owned businesses in a low and moderate income neighborhood in Buffalo. On the public facilities and infrastructure side, this is a broad range of activities that can then support economic development, housing, or general public well being. So, things from streets and like helping with, like, you know, what you classically think of as infrastructure, but also public safety improvements like sidewalks, work that might support mobility and safety for seniors, for example, or others who have mobility challenges. Um, another big piece something that I personally really uh, like to highlight is the creation of parks or tree planting activities to promote green space, which obviously we all know are really critical um, spaces for building community and for promoting health and well-being. Then the public services bucket. These are things like homelessness services, child care and after school education programs, housing counseling, food service programs, and programs that are explicitly and exclusively supporting older, older, uh, older adults, like senior food services or um, support for community centers that serve seniors. The example on the screen, Colorado Springs used $3 million in CDBG funds to expand the Springs Rescue Mission Campus, which provides comprehensive services for individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, and another example, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is carrying out a legal services program for seniors to provide um, assistance to senior homeowners facing foreclosure using CDBG dollars. And then they have another separate program um, to provide housing counseling targeted specifically to seniors in their community. So these, all of these wide ranging CDBG activities from mobility modifications through housing rehab to job training services can and do serve seniors across the country and can be a really valuable resource um, as you're partnering with cities and counties and, um, to benefit the populations you serve. So next slide, Nadia. Awesome, thanks. So in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Congress provided $5 billion in grants to states, cities, urban counties and insular areas um, to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the spread of COVID-19 through a program that we call CDBG CV. Um, so this is one of those one-time appropriations I mentioned. This is built on the CDBG framework, so funds can be used for the same 26 wide ranging eligible activities that we just talked about. Um, but these funds must be used to pre prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID. Um, so, Right now, obviously, as we're kind of moving out of the state of pandemic that we've been in, and 
in the past, were walking alongside grantees as they're considering how to use CDBG CV dollars to address long-term impacts of the pandemic and foster more resilient communities for the future. So things like helping run educational programs targeted to LMI families who may have, um, to students who may have fallen behind in their education due to absenteeism or inadequate in internet access um, on that broadband infrastructure projects. Um, also activities like housing counseling or credit repair services to folks who's, who may have lost income during the pandemic, pandemic and um, had their rental history negatively impacted, those sort of activities. So this is still um, a funding source that is very much present in communities and, and grantees are looking for creative ways to expend funds right now. And then if you go forward, awesome. So another recovery program um, that we've been talking about a lot is the Home American Rescue Plan or Home Art program. So this is $5 billion to HUD for homelessness assistance and supportive services programs. They went to 651 states, counties, and cities. Um, home art funds can be used for four eligible activities. You'll see on the screen, rental housing development or preservation, tenant-based rental assistance, non-congregate shelter, and supportive services. So what do, what do these eligible activities mean? Rental housing, fairly clear and straightforward. I think building new rental housing or preserving existing. Um, home art funds can be used for the construction of new structures or for acquisition or rehabilitation of existing structures to use as non-congregate shelter. So thinking like motels or nursing homes, um, reusing them in, for non-congregate shelter. Um, and that's shelter that provides private rooms or units um, on a temporary basis. Tenant-based rental assistance flexible is flexible support to provide assistance to households to help them afford the housing costs of market rate units in their area. Um, so think of Timberlake vouchers, right? And then supportive services under home art briefings, homelessness prevention services, housing counseling services, case management, child care, employment assistance, mental health services, kind of a wide range of things there. Um, so to give you a quick example, the city of Boston is using home art funds um, to provide so supportive services like support with housing searches or housing and benefits applications, case planning, ongoing healthcare um, for folks who are um, one of the four primary populations benefited by home art, which I'll get to on the next slide. And um, they're also extending some of some rental assistance programs with through the home art tenant-based rental assistance uh, funding. So on the next slide, these home ARP funds have to primarily benefit four specific populations per the law that authorized the funding. So those populations are on the screen. Um, again, persons experiencing homelessness, those at risk of homelessness, those fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual violence, stalking or human trafficking, and other populations requiring services or housing assistance to prevent them from becoming homeless or those who are at a great risk of housing instability. So home art funds have to specifically aid one of these populations. Uh, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Nadia to take all this high level overview programs and kind of help make it concrete for through more examples um, and then more information on how you can get involved and get access to funding. Thank you very much, Rachel. All right, continuing from a few of the examples that Rachel was giving, I'm going to dive into a few more examples and then take a hands-on approach and show you all how to find if there's funding in your community. To begin, on this side, you'll see examples of funding that directly support seniors. From building affordable apartments to providing stronger infrastructure to a wellness center, CDBG and home funds make a strong impact in communities. Diving a little bit deeper into a few of the examples that were on the previous slide, here we have examples of CDBG funds in use across the country. 
In Fayetteville, funds were used for kitchen improvements in the Senior Activity and Wellness Center, helping the center continue to provide meals to homebound seniors. In San Antonio, CDBG funds were used for home repairs, which also included rehabilitation activities, ensuring individuals could age in place. And in Oceanside, CDBG funds were used to provide nutritional meals to homebound seniors. Rounding out the last few of our examples of creative uses of funding to support seniors, on this slide, you'll see two additional ways that CDBG funds have been used in Texas and then in Massachusetts. In Dallas, funds were used to link caseworkers with seniors who were seeking services, whether they be food and housing options or counseling. And in Boston, funds were used to provide senior homeowners with emergency housing repairs related to water damage. And as you kind of reflect on these examples, we hope that by providing an in-depth look into the different ways that funding can be used, you won't feel limited when trying to imagine the different ways that funding can create a positive impact in your communities. On this note, you may want to find out what funding is in your communities. On this slide, we have links you can access to determine if there are CPD grantees in your community. Now, using the example of New York City, I'll showcase how you can see if there are CPD funds in your community. I first clicked on the link in that slide and it brought me to the HUD Exchange page. And here I am going to look up a grantee. I'm going to search by state and look for New York. And then under grantees, I will type in New York. And here I have New York, New York, and then search. And here is New York City, New York. And here I can see the different grants that are under the CPD umbrella and the funding that New York City had received. Here is a link to the newyorkcity.gov website if I want to learn more about the grantee. And then if I wanted to know if there's a particular point of contact for each of the different grants, then I could click on the grant and I could see who that point of contact is in that office. And here on this slide, you can see what we just went through where we searched by state, we looked up New York City, and then we were able to find the point of contact for the CDBG grant. To understand what funding is in your community and have a say in where it goes, it's important to understand the planning process. For CDBG, for example, grantees are required to submit a consolidated plan an annual action plan, and a consolidated annual performance and evaluation report, or a CAPER. The consolidated plan is the three to five year strategic plan, which outlines the intentions for funds and consultation and citizen participation, which we'll get into in a second. It is intended to be used as a tool to assess affordable housing and community development needs through public input and market analysis. The annual action plan is the proposal for what the funds will do that year. And the CAPER is the Consolidated Plan Annual Performance Report, which at the end of the year, grantees are required to submit, and it details how they spent their federal funds and whether or not they met their goals set forth in the Consolidated Plan and the Annual Action Plan for that year. Citizen participation comes into play in the Consolidated and Annual Planning Processes, and consultation occurs with stakeholders and nonprofits for plan creators to be able to connect with experts on topics and then guide their planning. If you're seeking ways to take an active role in how funding is used in your community, you can partake in the citizen participation process. Grantees are required to consult the community when they are preparing their plans, meaning that you can have a say in where the funding goes. Between citizen participation and then consultation with stakeholders in the community, there are a number of ways to become engaged. 
if we think about the New York City page that we were previously on that had that point of contact, you can contact those individuals to learn more about the public participation process. Many organizations, as seen here with the example of Washington, D.C., will also post whenever there is a public comment period onto their websites. And so you're able to access those websites and see if there is a, a public participation process that is forthcoming. Diving a little bit more into what public participation and consultation mean, on this screen is text pulled directly from the New York City 2021 to 2025 Consolidated Plan. For public participation, I understand the text is very small, so we um, made some of like the main points a little bit larger for everyone to be able to read. Um, members of the community were notified via, via email and mail notification public meetings, which were virtual and in-person, as well as a public comment period um, for the opportunity for them to be able to provide input on the consolidated plan. Along with that, what New York City puts into their consolidated plan is an explanation of the consultations that they did with different stakeholders and nonprofits in the area. And what they did was they divided up these consultations and described them by putting the agency or group name, what type of organization that was, what section of the plan was addressed in that consultation, and then what were the anticipated outcomes or what was the feedback that they received throughout those consultations. Here we have a few screenshots, which I will go through to show everyone a live example of how you can access these consolidated plans on the HUD Exchange website. And then we'll also show if you're trying to look these up on your own, where you could find the more recent plans. So going back to CDBG, and here we have that point of contact. When I scroll to the bottom, I can view the list of HUD grantee reports. And then from there, I'm going to go to consolidated plans, annual action plans, and CAPERS, which I just discussed. And once I click on consolidated plans, I'll be taken to a different website. And here, I'm going to look up the New York City consolidated plan that I had referenced in the screenshots on the previous slide. So I will choose a state. Oh. Bear with me as this loads. I'll wait a few more seconds and then walk through the screenshots if this does not load for everyone. Okay, so taking a moment to walk through these screenshots. Whenever I am looking for the consolidated plan for New York City, again, for 2021 through 2025, I would click consolidated plan in this bottom portion of the screen. And then from there, I would be taken to a website that has all previous consolidated plans, annual action plans, and capers. And from there, whenever I want to then see the consolidated plan for New York for 2021 through 2025, I would click the state, New York, and then I would look for the grantee, which is New York City. And then it allows you to click by type, which is very small on the bottom of this screenshot in the corner, and I would click consolidated plan. And then from there, I'm able to sift through different years 
and I would click 2021. And once I click search, I would be able to then see the consolidated plan for 2021 through 2025 that was submitted by New York City. And if I wanted to see on the New York website itself what this consolidated plan looks like, then on my own, I would search for the, let's say, New York City NYC consolidated plan and then public comment. As you can see, this is something I've looked up many times. And from there, I would go to the consolidated plan that's here in the Mayor's Office of Operations and I am brought to a page that has notices on public comment periods, notices on public hearing and public comment periods, all in different languages. And when I scroll to the bottom, the way New York City has this information set up is that they have their different plans here that are available for individuals to download. So if you didn't want to go through the HUD website and you're trying to look up, um, again, if you are from New York City, you're trying to look up whether there's a public comment period coming up or you want to know about the annual action plan that was submitted by New York City for 2023, then you can type in what I did into the Google search, which was New York City Consolidated Plan Public Comment. And you would be brought to this page where you could scroll and find, for example, the 2023 annual action plan. And we show these examples to show that whether you're going through your community's um, official landing pages or you're going through the HUD channel, that these documents are available to the public and they are there at your disposal to read through and to understand what's happening in your community. And we hope that through listening to these examples, you're able to find that information. So you have access to the consolidated plan or the annual action plan. You have that point of contact that you got from the HUD Exchange website. And now maybe you're trying to think about what kind of questions you could ask grantees of HUD funds. And if you don't know where to start with those questions, we've provided a few on the screen. Um, whenever you're thinking about what kind of initiatives are happening in your community, maybe you want to ask what priorities are these grantees funding? Sometimes the consolidated plans um, have very technical language and maybe it's not easy for someone to understand. And in that case, you can reach out to the point of contact that you have and ask them, what are the priorities that you're funding? Why are you funding these priorities? Asking about the action plan process or the citizen participation process would allow you to get a timeline and understand when can my voice be heard? When can I provide feedback on these initiatives that might be implemented in my community? Along with that, if you want to know the timeline for the implementation of these initiatives or the timeline for um, grantees to apply for these funds, you may ask, what is your funding cycle? And then you might be wondering why are certain priorities funded over others? Maybe you see an issue in your community and you feel like something isn't being done about it. Then you could ask your point of contact, how do you decide which priorities to fund? Is this a competitive process? And how can our organization apply? Are we um, able to be recipients of these funds so that we can enact that change that we want to see? If you're eager to learn more about the ways grantees and potential grantees can engage with their communities, as well as learn what kind of projects are possible with HUD funds, you can use any of the toolkits that are listed on this slide. They will be linked in the presentation that will um, be shared with the registrants. Um, here we have linked a community engagement toolkit, which focuses on centering shared values and activating participation. We have an LGBTQIA plus fair housing toolkit, which focuses on combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. And we have an affordable housing toolkit, which is a resource for those wanting to partner with municipalities to explore affordable housing development options. And on this final slide, we just 
have um, a little sneak preview of some of the things that are included in the community engagement toolkit. Using this toolkit, you can explore ways that grantees are encouraged to engage with their communities. And if you know of a grantee and you feel like they can really strengthen their community engagement techniques, then this toolkit is a resource that you can share with them if they're not already aware. And with that, we are at the end of our presentation. I see that there are some questions in the q and I will stop sharing my screen now. Okay, everyone. I see that some questions came into the Q&A, and I'm going to be your friendly moderator moderator for this portion. A uh, big question that came out through these questions in the chat was, will we get a copy of this PowerPoint deck? And the answer is yes. This is also being recorded as well. So you'll be able to listen to it again. If you say, what did she say again? Let's go back and take a look at that. So yes, you will get a copy of the slide deck and this is being recorded as well. Let's take a look at some of the other questions that came in. We had a question about whether HUD has ever considered lowering the age of senior housing. Uh, we find that our transgender community members are often in need of housing and safe space at an age younger than 62. That's a little bit of a two-part question. The good news is I can get you to yes, and here's how. Some of our funding sources here at HUD do require a age of 62 because our regulations are written that way for some of our programs. And I hate to tell you this, don't shoot the messenger, but 62 in our definitions is considered elderly. Many of us would not agree with that, but that's the regulatory definition that's out there, very, very old. However, with our programs that we've just talked to you about, CWG, home, others, while we do classify elderly or senior at 62, your community could decide to build housing or provide rental assistance or do other supportive services for folks that are under 62 and still consider them seniors. All they have to do is make sure, one, they meet that income eligibility component of are they low or moderate income, and two, they've described it in their action plan about who they're serving and why they're making it larger than just the 62 piece. So we can do some form of housing with the funding that comes out of our office, CPD, that doesn't have to be just 62 and older. We can do that lower age limit as well. Um, another question that came up was, can you define insular areas? That is pretty clear about, it's about island areas. So we're talking about Guam, we're talking about Hawaii and the islands, we're talking about uh, Puerto Rico. Those are our insular areas. Insular areas for HUD also receive their own allocations separate and apart. And so you, if you happen to be representing clients from that area, you'd wanna be able to look up that funding level and reach out to that local decision maker. I love the questions back to back. One of them is, says, uh, I live in a county of 250,000 people, over 10,000 square miles. Our town is a county seat and we have 50,000 people. Can you identify me, for me where we fit in the funding? And then Billy Rogers right after that said, what about rural communities? This is great. So if you have a population of 250,000 and there are a couple of other components, HUD reaches out to those communities and says, do you wanna become an entitlement and get your own CWG allocation? And if that local government decides, yes, they do, then they would be in that database search that Nadia just went through with you to be able to find not only them, but their allocation and the type of money they receive. If they either decide, nope, we're not quite big enough yet, we don't wanna take that on, or I'm smaller than that 250, such as a rural community. In that case, I can still re-access those dollars. You're just gonna to go to your state and be able to ask for that, what's going on and look at that action plan at the state level. A little bit of difference with the states. If you're going to the state to say, hey, I heard you have resources and I'd like to use some of your CDBG, your CDBG CB or your home ARC dollars for, my clients and my organization, you want to know that states do something called a method of distribution. And in that plan that they've written, that consolidated plan and that annual action plan, they're going to say to you, we have a state have decided to prioritize these areas that don't already get their own allocation. What does that mean? We are going to prioritize those rural areas that don't get their own allocation. So if you happen to be in one of those, that's a great spot to go up to the state, take a look at their action plan, see if there's a fit there. 
Um, I'm looking. Uh, we have a question about with the development of an ADU with an existing home be considered under the conversion adaptive reuse. So conversion for us, it tends to be something like an existing building that gets turned into housing. So it could be a school, it could be a library, it could be an office building, something you probably hear a lot in the news right now. Adaptive reuse, that could be an ADU as well. If it happens to be, you know, is there a structure there? We're big on ADUs. We want to talk to you more about that. We have lots of guides out there on that issue as well. Um, is there a way to specifically which LB, LGBT plus orgs are being funded through a HUD plan? Well, we could do a data search, but at the end of the day, it's because it's a local decision level, we'd have to kind of do a search based on, did they list the nonprofit group or did they list the activity? It would be a little hard for us, but we could do a bit of digging, come back some, with some examples for you if that's of value. And we'll follow up with Sage about whether that's an ask one to do. Um, we have another question. Does funding for homeless services include creating new facilities for temporary or transitional housing, such as LGBTQ plus youth? Yes. Barry, we love that question. So funding is there. You could consider either CDBG. We could also look from the transitional housing point of view. We could look at something around the home money as well as home ARP. There are eligible uses for all of those to do either sheltering or more permanent housing as well as permanent supportive housing. Uh, we have a question about, would any part of these funds be appropriate for a national LGBTQ social organization to apply for? Well, Charles, that's a great question, but it's a little bit more difficult. Local governments and states make their own funding decisions, and they need to be able to make sure those resources are being used for those community groups. So in that case, you'd want to make sure you would not be able to apply for national dollars to be national place. You'd be applying to many different local groups. And I will tell you generally, our grantees like to work with the grassroots groups that they're dealing with every single day in those communities as well. Not saying no, just saying a little bit of a harder lift. Um, and I think I am getting to, oh, I'm sorry, I got a question. Uh, I might want to define what an ADU is. And an ADU means accessory dwelling unit. So if you think about those granny flats that might be happening in the backyard of houses, it's a popular new way of looking at housing, um, particularly around affordable housing for our most vulnerable folks. Um, and I have a question about, sorry, my screen moves every time a question comes in. Can you talk a little bit about how developers working on LGBTQ plus elder housing who receive HUD funding are working with fair housing laws? Does HUD fund any culturally specific housing projects? Um, I'm going to have to get back to you about whether we fund any culturally specific housing projects because they don't have any awning off the top of my head unless Beth, Nadia I can jump me. in for a minute if you'd like. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Sage works around um, the culture specific housing. Um, and this just goes into the questions, the fair housing laws. Um, we don't go and create anything that is exclusive housing, but funding does allow creating the housing that is open and accepting to all sexual orientations and gender identity. So you can create LGBTQ elder housing that is kind of LGBTQ forward, that is constru constructed under the plan to create a welcoming a welcoming space for the community um, that has strong non-discrimination protections, that has strong um, ties to, let's say, a local not LGBTQ community center. Uh, it just has to be open for anyone who to apply, regardless of how they ad identify with sexual orientation or gender identity, as long as they're meeting the income requirements or age requirements, um, then they can be eligible for HUD funding, just as long as, long as you're not creating ex exclusive housing, but this housing is inclusive for all sexual orientations and gender identity. And we've seen a lot of success with that type of housing that goes through. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for helping me clarify that answer. I do want to also do a plug. HUD is going to be coming out with a new affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, uh, hopefully sometime in this spring timeline. Uh, we're hoping that prior to this, you were able to comment when it went out for public comment. And I think you're going to see stronger enforcement of making sure that more HUD housing is open and available to all. Okay. 
uh, I have a question. Can HUD assist city mayors with developing housing and com empty commercial buildings to repurpose office space? So our funding is available to be able to build affordable housing or repurpose commercial office space. We offer a variety of technical assistance, whether guides or one-on-one -on -one assistance to uh, help people understand how to do that, particularly at the local government and state government level. So yes, that is a resource we do provide. I think we got to that all of the questions. Did we miss anything? Are there any others out there? Our big takeaway here is our resources are at, on the street level, at the local level. We want you to be able to understand how they can be flexible and used to meet the needs of the folks that you serve. And more importantly, we want you to understand how to get engaged into the process where their decisions are made at that local or state level and who to contact so that you can become involved in that decision-making process as well. It's really important to us that the folks who receive our funding, our grantees, our counties, our cities, our states, hear from you about what the true need is for our low and moderate income households, and that you have a voice in that process as well in where decisions are made. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank everyone, um, uh, Baz, Nadia, and Rachel. Um, yeah, and I wanted to stress the you know, the goal of this was to introduce kind of the, all the funding that comes out of HUD and your office to organizations across the country. Um, a lot of great questions are specifically about what are the LGBTQ organizations that are being funded? How do you find them? How can we contact, um, sorry, I forgot to turn my video on. How can organizations come into contact? And we might find right now that there aren't a lot of LGBTQ specific organizations right now getting this funding. Maybe they're not eligible, maybe they don't know about it, um, but there's an opportunity to maybe kind of get the ball rolling. And maybe if your organization isn't eligible for this type of funding, as Nadia and Rachel kind of walk through, there's a lot of ways on the ground that advocates and organizations can be a part of this process. If an organization or grantee is receiving funding, we want them to make sure they know why the LGBTQ community, the LGBTQ plus older adult community, their needs need to be part of this funding. Um, if they're working to create senior housing funding, if they're working to create grants that are going to help older adults stay in their homes longer, make sure that organizations on the ground are being involved as part of that to make sure that it's affirming for the LGBTQ plus community. And really hoping that this process can help start that there. So I really appreciate Rachel and Nadia walking through how to find grantees, um, how to find that on, how to go through there and identify where can you get involved in the process? Because I think that's really important. Um, Maybe the LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus organization isn't getting the funding. That doesn't mean the work they're doing shouldn't be affirming and safe for the entire community. And that's what we're hoping to see here. Um, so I think, I don't think there's any other, other questions we'll get to right now, but we'll follow up with anything we didn't get to answer in the webinar. I will also send a follow-up email to make sure that anything that we didn't get to answer will be answered. And then if, there's any issue with people who aren't able to log on. This was recorded, so everybody will get a recording of this as well as we'll send a copy um, of the PowerPoint for folks to print out if that's easier for them as well. Um, but I wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Rachel, Nadia, again, thank you for taking the time to put the work together. Beth, thank you for taking the time to answer those questions. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone. And um, hope that this is the beginning of you know, um, great relationships on the ground moving forward.